I've done a lot of very difficult things in my life, but I have to say uh, probably the most difficult thing, maybe only secondary to raising kids, has been marriage. And I don't mean difficulty like because it's bad or it's just full of heartbreak, although there are moments of that. I mean, it's difficult because it takes up all aspects of my life. There is not a thing that I do that doesn't impact my marriage or isn't impacted by my marriage. And it's this constant journey where Jamie and I are learning how to interact in a healthy way with one another. Uh, <clears throat> and this has been a journey of growing with one another, of maturing. Uh, back when we first started, or early in our relationship, excuse me, we were living down in Long Beach, California. Uh, we were down there mostly so Jamie could go uh, and get her master's during the time she was working at a restaurant, and I was working uh, for a private ambulance company in L.A. County. And my job was most of the time, I worked 24-hour shifts. I would go to the station at 6 a.m., which meant I was getting up 4 o'clock, uh, getting ready, packing my lunch and my dinner because we didn't know if we would get to stop and eat. We might just be in the middle in between calls. Uh, and what I really liked to do most days for my lunch was make a tuna fish sandwich. And what I didn't know was in the midst of making the sandwich, there was a small problem that was brewing in our relationship. And when I say small, I mean small because it had to do with this right here, this tuna fish can. See what was happening is every morning I'd get up, I'd go to make my lunch, I'd get out the can, I'd open it up, I'd dump out the juices, I'd scoop out the fish, throw in the mayo, chop up my sweet pickles. And I know every time I say that, you, some of you guys give me that like disgusted look. Hey, I also put ketchup on my mac and cheese, so just deal with it. Uh, but after all of making my lunch, I would clean it all up, including the tuna fish can. I'd go to the sink and I'd rinse it out and then I would take the can, and this is where the problem was, and I would set it on the back of the, back of the sink. And then I would leave, I'd grab my stuff and I'd leave. And so Jamie would get up in the morning and go through her morning tradition, which involves a nice big cup of coffee. So she would go to the kitchen and her nostrils would be assaulted by this mix of coffee and tuna fish. And it disgusted her and it drove her, it drove her nuts, right? She was, she was so annoyed by this, but she wouldn't say anything to me. She never said anything to me about the tuna fish can. And so this went on for quite a long time until she got to the point that she had to say something. See, what, what was happening is Jamie had this expectation, an unspoken expectation and a very realistic expectation that I would take the tuna fish can off the back of the sink and go the five feet to the garbage can and deposit it in there. But she had never said anything. I was completely oblivious that this was any issue. And, and until she could communicate that to me, we were unable to grow. And this was hindering our relationship. And not only that, it provided me an avenue to recognize that even the little things in my life can have impact on other people. It was eye-opening for us. Our marriage and how we navigate through it has helped us to mature in, in basically all aspects of our life mentally, emotionally, spiritually. And today we're looking at what Peter has to say in his letter about marriage and how it grows us, how it can be an instrument to lead people to Christ and how it, like all the things he's been talking about, is a part of our life in which we are called to be holy. We're called to be holy to our government. We're called to be holy. Uh, slaves, we're called to be holy to their masters. And husbands and wives are called to live holy, live out the gospel in their marriages. And so we're going to take a look today at 1 Peter chapter 3. We're going to be looking for the first seven verses. And, and I just want to preface all this by saying this is a really difficult, hard passage. It's a passage that has been completely misused over the years. It is a passage that women have shared with me, women on our team have shared with me, has caused a, caused a lot of hurt, caused a lot of emotions, has been used to, to excuse or enable or even encourage abuse in, in marriage and between men and women. And so we need to spend some time diving through, before we even pull out the principles, diving through the context of this because what sticks out to us is not the same or at least not the same way it would have stuck out to the people reading this. So let's go ahead and dive in. It says 1 Peter 3, 1. Likewise, wives, be subject to your own husbands so that even if some do not obey the word, they may be one without a word by the conduct of their wives. When they see your respectful and pure conduct, 
Do not let your adorning be external, the braiding of your hair and the putting on of gold jewelry or the clothing you wear. But let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. For this is how the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And you are her children if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. Likewise, husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. And as I read through this, I know there are women who are hearing this, who, who this brings forth some hurt, some real hurt that is completely valid. And there are words in here that just stick out of this completely particularly in relation from men to women, how it says submission, gentle and quiet, talks about being the weaker vessel. And it's part of the problem and why this hurts is 21st century America is not first century Rome. When we go on this interpretive journey, when we look at the Bible and when we go to teach it, we have to make this journey. We look at what it meant to the original recipients of the letter and we have to cross this principalizing bridge and bridge that cultural gap. And there's a massive, massive gap for this letter or at least this part of the letter because the understanding, the reality, the accepted uh, and rightfully so accepted understanding of men and women is that today is that they have equal value. But back then, that was not the accepted standard. Men were the superior and women were inferior in all ways. And it played out very specifically in the family dynamic. See, in Rome during this time, there was this, this thing called paterfamilias. This was the understanding, the belief that men were to be the head of the household, uh, which there is a biblical model that says that, but this was so far from that. This was so far from, it was more of a tyrannical model where the husband had ultimate authority and power over his wife. So the head of the household would be the eldest male husband. Uh, and remember, this is an extended family. There are multiple generations living within this. And that male would have, have all authority over everything. And it played out in all aspects. If the man decided he wanted to divorce his wife, he had every right to do that. If the woman despite whatever abuses or anything, she had no recourse. She could not, under the law, divorce her husband. The husband, the husband, the men, all men could own property. The women, wives, they could not own property. In fact, they weren't even heirs to their husband's uh, belongings. If he were to perish, she didn't take over it. The eldest male relative did. The father he got to decide who was part of the family. If he wanted to disown a child, he had every right to. And then when a child came into the family, he got to decide if that child stayed part of the family. When a woman would give birth, a mother would give birth, they would take the child, place it on the ground or on the table, and it was not considered part of the family until that head of the household, that man, the father or the husband would come, he would pick up the child and embrace it. And if he didn't do that, often because the child may have a deformity or disability, they would take the child and they'd leave it in the field to die or be taken in by slavers. This model was dehumanizing to women, but it is the model which was accepted back then. So when he talks about all this stuff, he's, he's actually what we would say, look at and say, oh, that's really pushing women down. He was lifting them up out of the circumstances that they were in and saying, you have real value and purpose in the kingdom of God. The gospel is for you and you are to live out the gospel despite these circumstances. And to be clear, when we're going into this, this passage has too often been used to apply specifically when we're talking about the idea of submission to a husband. It's somewhere I've been twisted to say all women are to submit to all men, but that's not in there. He's talking specifically wives submit to your husband, not all women submit to all men. There is no biblical model. The gospel does not encourage women to submit to all men. It's just not there. And yet this passage, sadly, has been used to, to pressure women to do that. And so knowing all this, knowing the context to which he's writing, we're going to go ahead and dive in. What does he have to say about living holy in the midst of a marriage? 
he says like he starts off likewise and he uses likewise referencing back to uh, the the slaves to their masters because women at the time wives were looked at just a step above slaves he's drawing a direct corollary. she says wives be subject to your own husband so that even if some do not obey the word they may be won without a word by the conduct of their wives when they see you respectful in pure conduct. In essence, what he's saying is marriage is missional. That, that God has ordained this incredible institution where man and wife come together and through it, people can be one to the gospel. Through it, we can mature and become more holy people. And so he's saying to these wives that you, a lot of you, you're living with unbelieving husbands. You can turn them, not that you will, this isn't a promise, but you can, you can lead them to Christ in the midst of even living in paterfamilias model. He says, so that even if some do not obey the word, I love the word play he uses, if some do not obey the word, they be me one without a word that they may not believe in the truth, they may not believe in Jesus, but you can do it without having to say anything. Instead, you can do this by how you conduct yourself as transformed people living in the Holy Spirit out of the living hope that you have. How you live in relation to your husband is how you can lead your husband to Christ or how you can grow your husband in his relationship with Christ. And as he's also saying to the, to the ladies, hey, you're not going to nag your husband into believing. No one comes to Christ unbegrudgingly. He doesn't need a street corner preacher in the household. He needs someone who models the heart and actions of Christ. And you have, you have the tools to do this. And he's going to challenge him and say, it's not about how you look or what you say. It's about what you have. In essence, he's going to say, your beauty is going to win over your husband, but it's not the beauty that the world says you have. It's the beauty that exists inside you. Your beauty is internal. He goes on to say, do not let your adorning be external. The braiding of hair and the putting on of gold jewelry are the clothing you wear. He says, hey, the world says your value, your beauty is in your body. It's how you look. You will lust your husband to do things. And Jesus says, or excuse me, Peter says, you can't use the ways of the world to win your husband to the word. You can only do that by modeling Christ to him. And he specifically points out, he calls out the culture at the time. He says, the way in which women in the Roman Empire are living and the value that you have found for yourselves and the value that men have placed upon you strictly on your looks, it's not your value. You have much greater value than this. And he, he's calling out this fad at the time, the braiding of hair, the putting on of jewelry, the clothing. It said, there's, there's quotes from uh, philosophers all the time that the women would stack layers and layers upon their hair. It was like this this show, it was self-glorification. He says, you can't win your husband to Christ like that. All you're doing is drawing attention to yourself. You're supposed to be drawing attention to Jesus. And, and, and this passage, interesting enough, there are people who have used this passage to say, women, you can't braid your hair or you can't wear jewelry, uh, which is not what he's trying to do. He's trying to draw attention to this isn't the important part of your life. And interesting enough, no one I've ever seen used as the third item in there or the clothing your way to say you can't wear clothing. This is about what you use in relationship to your husband. He'll go on to say, but let your adorning be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable beauty of a gentle and quiet spirit, which in God's sight is very precious. It's just the world says your beauty is only found in how you look. Jesus says your beauty is your interior life, your heart, who you have been made to be. And he uses this word imperishable beauty. He says the beauty you have, your physical body, it will deteriorate. Time marches on. The beauty that you have now, you will age. And the fads that you participate in to heighten your beauty, they'll change with the wind. But the transformational work of Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit in your life, no man can take that away from you. 
Time can't take that away from you. In fact, it will probably strengthen you as you mature in it. That is the tool through which you will help your husband grow, not how you look. And he describes exactly what that beauty is. It's a gentle and quiet spirit. And I know for a lot of ladies that 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 specific calling has caused a lot of hurt. Because today, gentle and quiet in, in America today means something really different than the biblical model. It, to us, when we hear that, it means just be quiet and do what you're told and don't argue. And it's, that's not what he's getting at. He's not saying, hey, women, just be weak, passive participants in your marriage. He's calling them to something deeper. This isn't putting them down. It's raising them up. He's using words that we find other places in the Bible. And and it reminds me of one of my absolute favorite passages in Matthew 11. It's the only passage where Jesus describes his own heart. He says, come to me all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. What Peter's calling women to isn't to just be weak. He's saying, be like Jesus. He uses almost the exact same wording that Jesus describes himself. He says, engage in the Holy Spirit that lives within you. Uh, Grow the fruit of the Spirit. Live like Christ would live in relationship to your husband. I don't see anybody looking at Jesus and say that's a weak, passive guy. Why is it that women are now, when they're called to be gentle and quiet, looked at as weak or lesser than? He's saying engage in the life and the heart that Jesus has given you that resembles his own. That is what, how God has shaped you. That is how he values you. That is what he can use in you. And he's going to go on. He's going to talk some more about what this looks like. And he says to the women there, the wives, he says, respect your husband. Respect your husband. That he's going to talk about this idea. For this is how the, old, the holy, excuse me, the holy women who hoped in God used to adorn themselves by submitting to their own husbands as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. And I just want to say, ladies, like that's all we want. We just want to be called Lord. Like that's, if you take anything home, just call your husband Lord. Uh, But seriously, this is just, this kind of weird, just always jumps out at me. This is just a cultural thing. It's like calling her husband, sir, which still seems weird, but it's just the the custom at the time uh, out of honor and respect for their husband. And he says, and if you are her children, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening. And so Peter points to this biblical model. He does talk to women and say, you're supposed to submit to your husbands. So there is this model that is biblical in which husbands are to be at the head of the household where there's male headship. And in Ephesians, it it talks about this idea that husbands, you're to love your wife as Christ loves the church. This is, there is a biblical model, but it's in contrast to the model of paterfamilias, where paterfamilias would push women down, would exert power over them to better themselves. The model of submission and male headship that God points to is to build women up to not exert power over them, but take on the burden of ultimate responsibility. This is servant leadership. That's what he's talking about. He's talking about leading your family, leading your wife like Christ did the church. And Christ led the church by by setting an example of how to live, by challenging sin, by laying his life down to the point where he would die on a cross. And that is how leadership in the family should look like. And I've heard guys, you're saying, You've said before, like you've come, I've heard it. Like, I really just want a wife who would submit to me. And so I have to ask to you, how are you being a man who is worth submitting to? If you desire to have this model in your household, how are you living like Christ, being sacrificial, not leading by demand, but by example? 
And, and, and women, I've heard the same thing. I desire a husband who would lead his family in a biblical model. I've heard it from, from members of our staff that they desire or value their husbands doing that. And so if you're asking that question, women, I want to ask you, are you being a wife who is willing to follow? If you want your husband to lead your family, are you willing to let him lead? Are you questioning everything that he ever does? Are you, are you ignoring his desires and for, his, for your family to better everyone in it? If you desire this model, it requires both sides to participate fully and be intentional in creating it. He ends this idea. He says, if you do good and do not fear anything that is frightening, that these women were living with ungodly, unjust husbands. And he says, you're not to respond by being frightened by their actions, right? Your fear is only reserved for one person, and that's God. He's the only one deserving of fear. And if you live in fear out of your husband's sin, what is likely to happen is you re to respond in sin. You are called to be holy. Fear is for God. And if you keep the fear with God who is ultimately in control, you can live out good. You can live out the mission of Christ in your family. And guys, as I know some of you are sitting here, right? You're just like, yeah, hey, my wife, uh, you've heard everything. I'm ready for you to step up to this. Like Peter, he doesn't exclude you. He's got some words for you. He's going to say to you, there is a specific way in which you are to live with your wife and you are to honor your wife. That you too are to live holy in the middle of your marriage. You too are to live out the gospel in all aspects of your life. And that doesn't exclude your relationship to the person you're supposed to be closest to. He has a high, high calling for you. He goes on to say, likewise, that is women or wives. I just said, this is how you're to live in relationship to, to lead your husband to a greater relationship with Christ. So are you husbands. Husbands, live with your wives in an understanding way, showing honor to the woman as the weaker vessel, since they are heirs with you of the grace of life, so that your prayers may not be hindered. And there is just a part in there I know just like jumps off the page it sticks with us and it creates a lot of hurt and really distracts from what he's getting to. And it's these words right here, weaker vessel. Show honor to the woman as the weaker vessel. And I know that in 21st century America, pointing out the differences between man and woman, even the biological differences is like cultural heresy. But there is difference between man and woman. God created us different. And specifically, the word he's using here, weaker, only references physical differences. He says, husbands, you are physically stronger than your wives. And I know there are exceptions to those rules, but in general, that holds true. Biology is real. Differences is real. How God created us is real. Despite you being physically stronger, you are to live in acknowledgement of that, your strength is not a weapon against your wife, but a tool to build her up. You will honor her with your strength, not dishonor her because of her lesser strength. And, and, and I got to say, what's in there is just as important as the words he chooses not to use. He points out the difference in physicality and says they're, they're weaker but at the time he's writing this, men viewed women as inferior in every single aspect. They were clearly weaker due to the, the difference in just testosterone alone. But they viewed women as inferior intellectually. They, feared, they viewed women as inferior emotionally. They viewed them as dum-dums who you couldn't educate. They viewed them as uh, crazy, emotionally unrestrained women who couldn't be trusted to make rational decisions. And he says, he doesn't, he doesn't point those out because he doesn't say, that he doesn't believe they're true. Those are not biblical ideas. There are differences between us, but the men and women, neither one is lesser, which is different. 
And God created us to be different. He wanted to foster an interdependence between man and woman so that we could work together to support each other, to build us up. And our reliance upon one another would point us to the fact that we have to rely on our creator, God. This was supposed to be something beautiful and in our sin, we too often use it against one another to push each other down and it was never supposed to be like that. And then he takes this idea and says, even though your wife is different, even though she may be physically weaker, they are heirs with you in the grace of life. That you are different, but you are equally valuable. That man and woman, male and female, are equal image bearers of their creator. That man and woman are equal in the sight of God's kingdom. They are both heirs of the grace of life. They are both able to inherit the, the, the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. They are, you are equally valued. And he uses this word, uh, he uses this word heirs. In pattern familiar, there were no female heirs, but in the kingdom of God, man and woman, both are recipients of his love and compassion and sacrifice. And he gives specific ways in light of this, in light of the gospel has made true, in light of your equal values, but di or e equal value, but differences in makeup, you are to live with your wives in an understanding way. That part of your journey in marriage, part of showing this in a practical way that you value your wife as Christ values her, is to seek to understand her at a deeper level. And I know this is really can be really difficult. It can be very difficult to live with somebody and understand them, all right? I, I, I remember even as a kid seeing a book, uh, women are from Mars, or men are from Mars, women are from Venus. Like this is a completely understood idea. We are so different from one another and it is a challenge to understand each other, but we are called to understand each other. And this takes intentionality. This takes pursuit, uh, right? Jamie and I, we are very different people. We are very different people in lots of ways, and it creates misunderstandings. I re um, remember Jamie, she uses this analogy uh, that isn't hers. I've heard it other places, but I love it. It sticks out that the way I view the world, the way my mind works, right? There's a shelf, and on the shelf, there's all these boxes. And it, when I go to process something, I take off a box, I go through it, and then I put it back, and then I take the next box. But these boxes never touch. That's the one rule. These boxes can never touch. But my wife, Jamie, her mind looks like a bowl of spaghetti. Everything is, 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 is intertwined and mixed up. And neither one is wrong. But they make it difficult. And I understand the analogy falls apart. We're much more complex people than that. But I have to learn how to live with my wife and understand her fully. Right? She is a much more emotional person than I am. She has access to a range of emotions I don't understand. I couldn't name. They're not any less valid or real or good. They're just different. And we had to sit, figure out a way. How do we understand each other well despite these differences? And so we worked together. There was, there was this question Jamie would ask me often. What do you feel? What do you feel about that? To which I would respond, I don't know. I don't know or nothing. I, I don't feel anything towards it. And Jamie thought that I'm just blowing her off. I don't want to have a conversation. I'm just blowing her off. But the truth was, I didn't feel anything about them. Like they didn't elicit an emotional response. That's just who I am. I don't have this huge range of emotions. I know when I'm mad or angry, I can easily identify that. But all right, I, I'm rarely uh, sad in the way that she is. Like I don't get sad at most things. Like maybe when my dog dies or it's episode five of Band of Brothers. But beyond that, like I just don't get really sad. So she had to, we had to sit down and find a way that we could communicate and understand each other. So Jamie doesn't ask me anymore how I feel. She asked me, what do I think? Because I think a lot of things. I don't feel a lot of things about things, but I think a lot of things about them. We have to find ways to understand each other. And he says, showing honor to the woman in light of you being equally valued, in light of God dying for both you 
and her, you are to honor her out of that. The gospel should extend to how you treat your wife. You are to ascribe value to your wife in all that you do. And we wanted to think of some, as a teaching team, what are some practical ways you can honor your wife? How do you actually show that you value her? God values her. How do you show her you value her? So how to honor your wife? And these are three things. They're not by any means the only three things, but we wanted to give you men some practical ways. How are you going to honor your wife? And I, I just want to, Jason and I were talking about this. This is in light of living out the gospel. This is the pursuit of holiness in your marriage. This isn't a list of ways that you can manipulate your wife into doing what you want. This needs to be done out of a heart to honor her truly as who she is in Christ. So the first one we saw is value her input as equal. That God has paired you together and she has he has given you the gift of a woman who has different experiences and understanding. She understands better an entire half of the population better than you ever will. She has value to give you in your decision-making process, in your leadership of your family. You are not number one and she's not number two or three or four or five or six or whatever down the line. You're 1A and 1B. You have someone who has value to all that you do and you should treat her input the same as you would treat your own. The second one, you need to show her you honor her. And I've heard that you show honor to men by being respectful and you show honor to, to wives by loving them. So you need to know how to love your wife. You need to know her love language because you may be trying to love her in a way that she's not feeling loved. And there's this, there's this study, there's this whole book and, and there's tons of information about this out there. We'll give it to you at the end. But there are five love languages, words of affirmation, gifts, uh, quality time, acts of service, and touch. The five love languages, all the ways you can show love can fall into these five categories. But guys, the way you feel loved is probably not the same way your wife feels love, right? I feel loved by touch and gift giving, right? Jamie, if she wants to show me she loves me, she gets me a gift. And, and sometimes this gift isn't just like a present. It's she does something for me that's a gift. Like she just makes me a meal. I feel loved when my wife makes me a meal. I've heard it said that, that the way to a man's heart is through food. I don't know if that's true for every guy's, but it's true for me. But those are not the way my wife feels loved. I don't bring my wife home a bouquet of flowers because gifts are not her thing. She feels, lo being, she feels th that love when I perform acts of service, and I spend quality time with her. I can't love her the same way that I want to be loved or I feel loved. I have to learn how to love her to show her that I honor her. And the last one that we have is value her contribution is equal. That what she does for your family is equally as important and valuable as what you do for your family that she may be a wife who is a stay-at-home mother. She may be a wife who has a career. She may be a wife that does some mix of both of these things or something I'm just completely forgetting. But it has value to your family. It has equal value to your family. Her contribution is as important as your contribution. And society, I know the world says that our contribution, our value is measured by what we earn. That works really well when we look at capitalism, and capitalism is a great economic model. It's not a model for your household or your marriage. And how do you actually show this? Because it's not just saying you value her contribution. It's living it out. And so one of the things that I, that I want to say is <clears throat> that I've seen in the past husbands, right? You come home for your career, you put in your eight, your 10, your 12, whatever hours it is. You come home and your wife's been doing her thing. She's been dealing with the job or her kids or your kids, excuse me. And, 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 and she's been working that same amount of hours for you. And you go home and you sit down on the couch and your expectation is for her to continue taking care of everything in the household while you rest. That dishonors her. That devalues her work. The job of the household, taking care of your family, isn't exclusively her job. It's both of yours. 
and you value it by her contribution by continuing to participate in your family when you're nine to five or whatever it is ends. Her job doesn't end after eight hours, neither does yours. And he ends this passage. He says, so that your prayers may not be hindered. He makes this connection. He draws this cause and effect. Men, you honoring your, dishonoring your wives means that your prayers will be hindered. And we don't really understand why we as a teaching team sat down and said, how does this happen? What's, the, what's going on here? Why? Because I want to know the why. And we had some really good ideas and theories, but they're just that, good ideas and theories. Peter doesn't give a why, so I'm not going to either. Our marriage is an important aspect of our lives. It is where, I think Jason said it a couple weeks ago, the rubber meets the road of how we are to live holy. You are called to live holy in your marriage. You are called to use your marriage to build your spouse up in their relationship with Christ. Thank you guys for joining me today. I love you. Have a good day. I'm going to release the campus pastors. Thanks for sticking around for our transformational moment. And we really wanted to give you something very practical to go home with. We've been talking about living in relationship with your husband and wife, how we can interact as spouses. And one of the things we talked about today was uh, the idea of the five love languages, that it is a way that husbands can show love to their wife. But the truth is it works both ways that both husbands and wives need to feel love and we need to understand how to love one another. And so we need to know our love languages. You need to know how to love your spouse well. And so what we want to ask that you do is find your love language with your spouse. Go sit down together, explore what it is so that you can help each other uh, honor one another, respect one another, love one another in a way that they actually feel it. Because I think a lot of you guys, you're trying to do this and you're just not going about it the right way because because you are you only know how to love yourself well. And so there's the website, fivelovelanguages.com. You can go there. You can take some uh, tests together. You can help each other. And what's interesting is it can give you some real help. There's this thing called dialects within the languages, right, that uh, break down what that exactly looks like. Because I talked about my wife. She loves acts of service. Well, there's specific acts of service. Uh, I, it's not just like cleaning in general. She wants the front entryway to the house clean because that makes her feel peace when she walks in the home. And so I was taking care of the dishes every night instead of putting the shoes away. This was effective. This was far more effective. So uh, I, we encourage you to go do this, learn how to love each other better. Thank you guys. Have a great day.